I decided that I should learn some Greek. And I thought, you know, I'm going to learn like just kind of modern Greek and then to give me a foundation uh, to go back to some ancient Greek. And it's not going well. It, it, it is a difficult, difficult language. I mean, do, do you know what, the, what sound the letter U makes? It makes the M sound. So if you want to like say mama, you have to write it like that's mama right there. You know, I mean, the whole thing is so confusing. The sound, the P makes the er sound. Do you know how you say yes in, in Greek? This is where I knew I was in trouble. Nay. Nay. I mean, like this, this doesn't make any sense. So I'm on day 56 on my streak. I'm going forward. But I'll tell you what, I am more confused than when I started. And when they say it's all Greek to me, I understand. Like it's, it's just tough. And, you know, there's a lot right now. There's a lot of confusion uh, out in our world. I mean, people are just confused. You look out there, you don't have to look too far of people like, what are they doing? And I want you to understand, we serve a God of wonder, and we serve a God of growth and surprise and new, a God who does new things all the time. But we do not serve a God of confusion. He's not a God of confusion. 1 Corinthians 14.33, I love how the New American Standard puts it. It says, God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. So if you are confused, I want you to know that God did not author that confusion. God does not bring confusion to us. One of the things that uh, Ken says to me all the time, and I love it, he always says, let peace be your guide. Now, if you didn't get anything else this whole morning, just hold on to that. that. That's a huge one. Let peace be your guide. And so when anxiety or fear or pressure, when they are taking the wheel, this is what you do. You stop the car and you just put it into park until you can find peace. Do not let pressure guide you. Do not let fear and anxiety guide you. This is why I don't own a timeshare. Because like I've gone to like those little things, you know, and I'm listening like, oh, wow, that sounds good. But every time he's like, okay, are you ready to sign? I'm like, no, I'm going to go pray. And you could see the guy like, oh, don't go pray, you know. But like, yeah, that's, I'm not going to do anything until I can go home and pray. And, and if it is the best deal, the most wonderful thing in the world, and I can't stop, and I can't find peace, and I can't seek God, I'll just let it go right on by. It doesn't matter. I don't care how good it is. If I, if I can't just come before him with peace, I don't want any part of it. So if peace doesn't have the wheel, hit the brakes. Slow down. Now, I know, I, I know you have difficult decisions, and some of them you have to make fast, and I, and I know there's hard things that you have to do. But don't let fear or anxiety or pressure or confusion drive the car. Has anybody here ever gotten themselves into a bad deal? Or, or have you ever overreacted? Anybody here ever stick your foot in your mouth? All right. Now here's the question. Did peace get you there? Were you acting out of peace to get into that situation? I bet almost none of us were, right? And we serve a God of peace, not of confusion. So, so since he is a God of peace, do you know what the Holy Spirit's voice sounds like? Peace. It's one of the things that I, that I tell our kids all the time. Gina and I, we, we always say, okay, what brings the most peace? As you think about your options, what is the peaceful option? What's the one where you just have this confidence, this God confidence and peace? Now, it may be a difficult thing. It may be a thing that you don't want to do, but you just know like, okay, God is in this and God brings peace in the middle of it. There's so much confusion in our world right now. There, there's moral confusion and there's gender confusion and there's identity confusion and there's political confusion. But we serve a God of peace. Now, I, I want to talk a little bit about some of the openings for spiritual confusion. Some of the ways that we get kind of carried away and stuck in it. And you know the first thing, one of the things that will often bring confusion to our lives is just pain did a little inventory of like just big sins. I was just looking, you know, like the big ones in scripture where they just really messed up. And you, you find this theme that there's often, the, they come some pain, some disappointment often comes before the big sins. I think we have a chart if you want to bring that up for me. So here's just a few of them. So like Cain, okay, so he gets, his offering gets rejected. The Lord doesn't, you know, and he's got this pain, this hurt. And what's the result? Kills his brother. 
Moses, he's surrounded by these complainers that are driving him crazy, and he's just like, rah, so frustrated, he just strikes the rock instead of speaks to it like he's supposed to. And Sarah has this burden, this pain, this longing for a child, and she becomes a scoffer, and she, and she forces another solution. And Saul, that's King Saul, not, not the Apostle Paul, he, he's insecure and he's rejected. So what, he tries to hunt David down out of his pain. Joseph's brothers, we talked about them just a little while ago. They get insanely jealous, and so they kidnap him, and they traffic him. I mean, just horrible things. And Job's wife, I think this is really, really interesting. Because if you look at the beginning of Job, you, you see that Satan comes to God, and he says, this is what Satan challenges God with. He says, if you strike him, he'll curse you to your face. That's what he says. And so Satan strikes him. And he loses everything. And Job's wife is like feeling this pain. And do you know what she tells Job? It's crazy. She says, curse God and die. So what happened to her? What was she feeling and going through that she becomes the mouthpiece of the devil? Like she starts giving Satan's plan to her husband. Curse God. Wow. Where pain can take us, where hurt can take us. And, and this is, listen, you will be sad sometimes in life. I mean, you, you can grieve and grieve heavily and just feel the weight of like, like loss. But listen, don't ever despair. We are pressed, but not crushed. We're persecuted, but we're never abandoned. We're struck down, but we are not destroyed. Do not give yourself over to despair. Because the enemy wants to come in, and you know what he wants to give you in the midst of it? Lies like self-injury. Or, or isolation, or, or self-protection, or just self-hate. And it's how Satan wants, he just whispers in your pain. Just know that he wants to come in the middle of it. And I see all that confusion out there. And I'll tell you what, it doesn't make me mad at all. It breaks my heart. Because what you see are real needs, and you see real hurts, and you see people just getting the wrong answer for a real need going to the wrong place to deal with these things inside. To go back to Sarah, you know, as she's longing for this child, and she's 90 years old, she still doesn't have a child. It reminds me of Proverbs 13, 12, where it says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. And I just want to caution you, be careful when you have given up hope. Okay, so, so you might say, I have given up hope that my husband will ever change. And you know what? That might be true. He may never change. But it's what comes next. So what? I have given up hope. And be careful. I want to just carefully consider what you're going to do next. I have given up hope that my husband will ever change. So I'm going to reach out to my college boyfriend. Right? I'm going to leave him. Okay, or, or maybe uh, I'm going to love him for who he is and, and I'm going to try to learn to be who I am. Or I, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait on God to show me what I should do. And, and peace, it can be decisive. It could be immediate. But you know, it's not afraid to just take its time. So when hope leaves, just be careful and think about what you're going to, to use next. Because it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to grow it's an opportunity to become stronger. It's an opportunity, but, but it's also an opportunity to, to just fill it with disaster. You, you can fill, see, when you get a pain, it, it rips this hole. And what are you going to fill it with? An opportunity is to put, okay, the trust, faith, belief, strength, growth. Or, or you can open up your heart and, and go for substitutes and just numbing and false answers and bitterness and it all just leads to this horrible confusion. So it comes down to where are you going to look as you go through it? Catch this. Always listen to your pain but never trust its advice. I think that's pretty good. I'm gonna say that again. Always listen to your pain but never trust its advice. Pain is great at showing you there's a problem. It is horrible at telling you what the solution is. Pain is horrible at solutions, really good with showing problems. For example, I feel so alone. Listen, that's a real thing, and you need to pay attention to that, okay? And what does pain say? So I'm going to go out tonight and make whatever connection I can. 
That's pain. That's horrible advice. That's pain's idea. It's not God's idea. So let pain present the problem, but let truth provide the solution. I feel so alone. Lord, what's the solution? Lord, draw near to me. Lord, I want to know you as a friend. Help me connect with other believers, other people who love you, people who are going to build me up. Help me, help me to press into those relationships that are life-giving because this is a real need and I want your truthful solution. And these unresolved pains and issues that we carry, it's just a playground for the enemy. You know, it's an insightful and powerful statement when people say, well, it all started when. I've had people, things that I've heard people say, it all started when my mom died. Oh, I'm so sorry. I can see how that pain would have opened you up. It all started when I had that abortion. Oh, my God is so for you. He is so with you. He still has so much life for you. It all started when my ministry, when it just failed and it didn't work. Years and years ago when I was, uh, I was student teaching to become an English teacher, I was at Fort Collins High School, and so I'm you know, going through that, that little program, and I had this master teacher, his name was Carl as well, and he was in his 60s, and he knew that I was a Christian, and we were talking about faith and, and belief. He said, yeah, you know, I grew up Baptist and I went to my little Baptist Sunday school and I was 12 or 13 years old and I brought a friend with me and I don't remember exactly what happened, but it was something like, so, and my friend, he like said some cuss words there and the Sunday school teacher pointed at him and said, you can never come back here again. And he says, and that's when. He's 60 years old, thinking back to when he was 12 and that's when I decided I didn't want anything to do with Jesus and I didn't want anything to do with the church. Be careful. You know, vows, we make these vows that come out of pain and they almost always cause trouble. That's why Jesus said, let your yes be yes, let your no be no, everything else that comes from evil, just don't do it. And maybe you said, I will never let anyone treat me like that again. And you know what, you need your boundaries and that's good, but be careful of those vows. I mean, I've made vows. Well, one vow I made is I will always, always be involved in my children's lives. Now that sounds really, really good, right? And there's some good to it. But my family more than once, I mean, you could just see it in their eyes. They're like, Dad, can we calm down about that now? Can, we, can you give me just a little bit of space here? Because I'm doing it out of pain, all right? So be careful. I mean, your pain's going to come, but what are you going to do with it? There's another door for confusion, and it's simple. It's just deception. You see that throughout Scripture. That Satan wants to just come and lie to you, to misinterpret what's going on. And so we go back to the very first one. You know, back to, let's go back to Eve. And he comes and he says, did God really say? What a crafty thing to do. Because, okay, we're putting the words of God into question, but more than that, we're putting God into question. Is God really like that? <laughs> That's the kind of guy he is? He really said that to you? And you can see her, her confusion in the count. And, and she's like, no, no, it wasn't like that. He just said, we can't eat from one tree in the garden. And, and then we'll die. And he says, no, no, you won't die. That's what always comes, you, you know, just to confuse us. That's not really what's going to happen. It's a common tactic of the enemy just to come, oh, you're such a sweet kid, but you just don't know. You just don't have all the data. Your view is just so simplistic. And you need to get to the deeper truths. And listen, there are deeper truths in the scripture. There's no doubt about it. I mean, there, there are people with their doctorates who can go deep into this book and like have all sorts of crazy arguments that I don't understand. But the gospel's pretty simple. It's really not that complicated. I mean, even the book of Revelation, which is probably one of the most complicated books in all of scripture. I mean, even the most simple person can see Jesus wins, I wanna be on his side. If you get that, you're all right. You know, and, and, and you could philosophize about the fruit, right? But here's the thing, don't eat it. Really, really simple. You know, well, metaphysically, it's stand, blah, blah, blah. Listen, just don't eat it, you'll be okay. And this is what, this is what deception will tell you is, oh, that's the old way. That's stifling. You know what Satan loves to tell you? God is so limiting takes away your freedom. You're so uninformed. It's the exact opposite of what God does. 
He brings so much life. He brings so much freedom. There's so much safety in his direction and his commands. But the enemy will come to you and say, no, see, there's actually a better way. You can go around that way. You don't have to do it that way. There's a new way. And you know, there's, that's true for like medical procedures or like using my phone, but it's not true for what's right and wrong. Hebrews 13 tells us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, forever. And here's a passage that I keep going back to over and over. I mean, we've seen it a number of times, but it's like become kind of like my new theme verse for morality. It's one that I, I think we should, we should just memorize as a church. It's Jeremiah 6, 16. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. The truth is pretty simple. And you know what happens? It doesn't limit you. It doesn't hurt you. You'll find rest. The rest for your soul that you're hungry for. But you and I and they and we all say, ah, well, we're not going to walk in it. One more area of confusion takes hold of our hearts. It's taking hold of this world right now. It's just sin. Sin begets sin. So we'll go over to James chapter 1, verse 13. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But how's it come? Well, each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. And here it comes. After desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. There are two choices that come with any sin. Two choices. Repent. And that simply means to turn, to say, I'm not going to do it that way, to confess, Lord, I have sinned, and I, I'm going to go the other way. That's repentance. That's one choice. The other choice is to just go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into it. I think about when I started to party in college. You know, and as I started to do that, you know what? Things didn't get clearer in my life. Things didn't make more sense as I went deeper into that. I didn't become less selfish as I partied more. I didn't become more honoring to the opposite gender as I began to, to go into that. See, sin is a lie. And the only way to keep living a lie is to embrace more and more and more lies. And see, if unchecked, that pain and that deception and that sin, it coalesces actually into an entire worldview. I mean, it, it shapes the way we look at everything. And it brings a confusion that, that's so deep and so complicated that we don't even know where it came from. We have to build our whole life around our sin if we want to keep our sin. James talks about this. So just go over to chapter 3, verse 18. And the title that my Bible has for this little section here is Two Kinds of Wisdom. There are two kinds of wisdom. Verse 13 of chapter 3 in James. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in humility that come from wisdom. Here's the first kind. But if you harbor bitter envy, selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Be honest, be humble with what's going on. Such wisdom, here's the second kind, does not come down from heaven, but it's earthly, unspiritual of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, and look, we see this word again, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. This word again, peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. There, there was a, a man who came here a number of years ago, well, 15 years ago or so. He doesn't go here anymore. He didn't stay very long. But he was, he was just like, I, I'm so depressed and I'm so unmotivated and I'm so confused and I just can't seem to go forward in my life. And I was like, okay, well, what? tell me, like, what's going on in your life? And he says, well, uh, about nine o'clock I get up and I, I smoke weed and I watch TV. And I say, okay, and, and then what? And he says, that's what I do all day. I do that till I go to bed. I'm like, okay, and, and then what happens the next day? Well, that's every day. So you do that every day. Watch TV all day and smoke weed all day. Yeah. And you're not happy? And, and you're not finding motivation? You're not finding life? So you're just going deeper and deeper into a cycle of escape? We got to pull out, right? Here's the thing. The, the world wants the stuff that Jesus gives without taking Jesus. Wants what Jesus will offer you without making him your Lord. 
And I get it. You know, I want all the nutritional benefits of a salad, but I just want the croutons and the bacon bits. That's it. And people, people want peace, and they want goodness, and they want unity, and they want love, and they want justice, but I'll pass on the one who brings the real thing. I'm going to pass on the source. Verse 17 of our James passage, purity, peace, consideration, goodness, mercy, sincerity, righteousness, it is all built around Christ. And you can't build our world and our worldview around sin and expect to be getting the benefits and life of Christ at the same time. So if you remove Christ, you have to build a whole nother answer, a whole nother wisdom, a foundation of your life which confuses everything. And you know what the new system is? It's verse 16. It's self. See, where Jesus is the highest good. You, you can take him as the highest good or you can replace it with self. Aristotle, he said, the ultimate good is happiness. And he said, and yeah, you know, if you've got to do some virtue to get there, that's fine. But what, what the ultimate good is happiness. And Jesus says, no, only God is good. God is the ultimate good. And how are you going to find the ultimate goodness outside of Jesus? And happiness, I mean, it's a, it's a great thing, and it's close, but it will fall short. No wonder it's getting so confusing out there. Because earthly wisdom says what I feel, or, or, or how I feel, it's more important than anything. And I need what's owed to me, and, and, and I'm going to go after what makes me happy, and what I feel to be right, and what I feel to be true. And such a wisdom, i got to tell you, in the end, it just confuses everything. So here's a remedy. When confusion comes, wait. Just wait, wait just a minute. And then do this, ask, what's true? And you know, I've just found a powerful exercise. Well, when I'm confused, like I'm like, okay, wait, are we supposed to do this? Is that what God's asking or is this? Well, I don't get it. It's just to stop and I pull back and I say, okay, now what do I know to be true? Take your confusing situation, get a little piece of paper and say what I know to be true. You know, and really confusing things, I can't tell you how many times that I'm like, okay, now what do I know to be true? And I'm like, oh yeah, that's in here. That's how I know that to be true. And that's what I'm going to stand on. And, and you could go on out there and get all complicated with yourself. But you know what? I'm just going to stand on the simple gospel. I'll be here waiting for you when you're done out there. And I can't tell you how many times the word of God has just saved me. Again and again. Now, listen. Learn cool and amazing things. Go, go learn something new. Let things blow your mind. Do you want to have your mind? Here, I'm going to blow your mind right now. Okay. Ready? So here, here it goes. Did you know that coconuts kill more people than sharks? It's true. Every year, about 150 people die from a coconut. And every year, about 10 people die from sharks. Here, I'm going to blow your mind. Did you know that the fastest man-made object ever is, a, is a, a manhole cover? So in 1957, there was an underground nuclear test, and there was a manhole cover over it, and it blew the cover off, and it went out to space at 130,000 miles an hour. Still out there probably, moving at 130,000 miles per hour. This is my favorite one. I'm going to blow your mind. In 1994, there was a blackout, lost power in Los Angeles. And 911 received over 100 calls to report this strange glowing cloud in the sky. And do you know what it was? The Milky Way. They had never seen it before. Isn't that crazy? So go ahead and let your mind be blown. But listen, no matter what you learn, no matter what you see, no matter what you hear, you already know the most important truth. You know what's right. And you know what's wrong. And when you look out there and everybody's confused, you come back because you know who Jesus is. You know what Jesus does. You know what God is like. You know what God likes. And you and I, we know how much we need him. And if you cannot find peace in your heart, then your heart is likely in the wrong place. Because he is not the God of confusion. He is the God of peace. And so we come back to peace and we let the God of peace be our guide. Holy Spirit, help me to find peace in the middle of this. And here's the thing, some of us, in some areas, our whole framework needs to change because we've built the whole thing on a lie. 
And, and I want you to understand that if it's built on a lie, it's coming down anyway. So let's take it down while we still can. See, truth is our guide. Peace is our barometer. Fullness of life and joy is our fruit. So whatever you face, whatever you hear, whatever you see, stand on his truth. Stand on his word. And I, I, I'm almost certain things are going to get more confusing. But it cannot change what he said. No matter what they say, it cannot change what's true. No insight, no pain, no disappointment, no difficulty, no idea can change the truth. So rest on his truth and in that rest in his peace. Lord, I thank you so much for your truth. I thank you, Jesus, that you are the truth. And I ask, Lord, that you just open our eyes to those things, Lord, that we've let in because of our pain, to the lies that we believed because of what's happened, to the things that confuse us, Lord. And I pray that you would teach us to discern, to let peace be our guide, to hear your word, to hear your voice. And I thank you, Lord, that in that is freedom. In that is fruit. And in that is life. In Jesus' name, amen.